It's my pleasure to welcome you to Secrets of Prophecy. My name is David Price, and this is coming to you from Australia. You know, I've done extensive tours to the Middle East and to Europe to investigate all the claims of the ancient biblical writings and also study the claims that are made there. I also investigated the Reformation period of Christianity. I strongly believe that when reviewing the traumatic events of the past few years and the strong possibility of even more to come, that the Hebrew scriptures can bring enlightenment and hope to both our turbulent past and our uncertain future. This fascinating series, Secrets of Prophecy, will answer your big questions about our spiritual and secular life, plus cover the biblical foundation for all the prophecies now being fulfilled regarding rising political powers. So I want to welcome you to Secrets of Prophecy. And in this series, we are going into session number one. It's entitled, Who Will Control the World? Now, it's actually based on an extensive Bible study. And in this session, we're going to discover what does an ancient biblical secret of prophecy have to do with a coming new world order or world domination. That's what we're going to look at in session number one, who will control the world. Gracious Heavenly Father, we ask that you will guide, bless and direct as we open your word that we may see amazing things under the power of the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. So thank you so much for joining me for session one, who will control the world. The study guide is downloadable and the details are under the uh, title bar right there in front of you on YouTube. Let's get into our lesson. As rampaging Adolf Hitler marched his troops across Europe, Franz Hasel, a German soldier in the elite troops of Pioneer Company 699, boldly told his superiors that Hitler was doomed to failure. The reason? a cryptic prophecy from the book of Daniel outlining future world empires and Germany was not one of them. At the risk of death, Hazel told his leading officer, Captain Mikus, that Germany would never control the world. Now, this was hugely foolish talk because Adolf Hitler had predicted a united Europe and a thousand year world domination. He called it the Third Reich. He was very, very clear in what he wanted to achieve. See, my people, we do not need anything from God. We do not ask anything from him except that he may let us alone. In another statement in March 1941, Adolf Hitler said, we want to fight our guns. We want to fight our own war with our own guns without God. We want to gain our victory without the help of God. Friends, the result was at the Russian front, 2.7 million German soldiers died. As is detailed miraculously in Hazel's daughter's book, only by the hand of God did Franz Hazel survive. As Unit 699 drove deep into Russia, Captain Mikus believed what Hazel was saying and carried extra fuel, hoping for a safe retreat. Unfortunately, only seven of the 1,200-man unit arrived safely. The predictions by the prophet Daniel came true with devastating results. Friends, the book of Daniel was written in the ancient city of Babylon. Many years earlier, Nimrod was the ruler of Babylon, or Babel, as it was known back then. In fact, Nimrod was the father of the secret mysteries of nature religions, and these mysteries were passed on through the generations until we come down until the time of King Nebuchadnezzar II, and that's where our Bible study starts tonight. 
Nebuchadnezzar became known as one of the greats in history, a military conqueror and a great builder. Among other things, Nebuchadnezzar built the famous Hanging Gardens of Babylon. This amazing structure became one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. The historians tell us that Nebuchadnezzar built the Hanging Gardens of Babylon for his precious Median wife, which is today in the country of Iran. She lived up in the mountains surrounded by greenery, and so he tried to replicate that for her. What a wise husband he was. Early in his reign, Nebuchadnezzar set out on a military campaign toward Egypt. On the way, he captured the city of Jerusalem, taking captive the best and brightest of the Jewish nation, including the young prophet Daniel. As a prisoner of war, Daniel remained true to his creator, God, despite being trained in all the customs and mysteries of ancient Babylon. While Daniel was in captivity, God gave Daniel the power to unlock a mysterious dream. This dream revolved around future world superpowers and the ultimate future for planet Earth. It was the contents of this dream that not only stopped Adolf Hitler, but also many other aggressive leaders before him. We're asking tonight who will control our world in the future in this session one of Secrets of Prophecy. So people are asking, will it be the United States of America? Will it be Israel or will it be China? Could it be a religious leader such as the Pope or a united Europe? Will one of the nations of Islam dominate the new world? So friends, in order to know the future, we must first understand the past. The amazing prophecy that captured the attention of Franz Hazel is found in the second chapter of Daniel. I recommend that you take some time and read through the second chapter of Daniel. In fact, you can pause this uh, video presentation and read it through now. And now we're going to go ahead and unlock the prophecy step by step for the Bible has power. And so we'll have all the text on the screen. Thank you so much for joining us. We are looking at Secrets of Prophecy, session number one, who will control the world? Let's go straight into this Bible study now. and We're going into question number one. What happened to Nebuchadnezzar one night? We're going to go into Daniel chapter two, as we said, and look at verse one. If you have the study guide there, you've downloaded it and printed it out, then please go ahead and fill in the missing words. It says, now in the second year of Nebuchadnezzar's reign, the second year there is highlighted because we're going to have a five question quick answer quiz at the end of this session. It'll be multiple choice. So see how you go. I want you to remember what year it was. Now, in the second year of Nebuchadnezzar's reign, Nebuchadnezzar had dreams. There's our answer. And his spirit was so troubled that his sleep left him. You can see that this was a very traumatic time for the king. Something important had happened. So Nebuchadnezzar had a dream that troubled him. As he lay awake at night, he knew he dreamt of something of great importance, but he just could not remember the exact details. Let's go to question two at the top of page four. What did Nebuchadnezzar ask his official secret revealers, the wise men, to do? In Daniel 2, 2 to 4, we read, Then the king gave the command to call the magicians, the astrologers, the sorcerers, and the Chaldeans to tell the king his dreams. So all of the wise men were summoned, all the wise men were summoned, and they were demanded to give an answer to the king. It's interesting and fascinating to note that the wise men had been trained in all the secret knowledge and mysteries of Babylon. As intelligence was mixed with magic and religion, these men were the greatest code breakers in the land. They were used by the king to predict the timing and tactics of enemies, to cast spells on behalf of the king and read the future through studying the stars and the planets. To the wise men of Babylon, the interpretation of a dream was not unusual or difficult. 
That is, of course, if the king told them what the dream uh, was in the first place, but he didn't. Question three, could the wise men reveal the secrets and what was the result? We're going to Daniel chapter 2, looking at verses 6 to 13, but focusing on verses 10 and verse 12. The Chaldeans answered the king and said, there is not a man on earth who can tell the king's matter. They were very emphatic. No one on earth can come up with this answer. Don't blame us. We go now to verse 12, Daniel chapter 2 and verse 12. It says, for this reason, the king was angry and very furious. He was incandescent. He was white hot with rage. And he gave the command, a hasty command, to destroy all the wise men of Babylon. What was the point of having wise men when they couldn't answer the question? The wise men were well accustomed to interpreting dreams. That wasn't a problem. Yet all the secret knowledge of Babylon was not sufficient to tell the king the dream he'd forgotten. How true it was when they said there's not a man on earth who could interpret this dream, only the God of heaven, as they were soon to find out. Question four, when Daniel heard about the situation, what did he ask the king? Daniel 2, 14 to 16. So Daniel went in and asked the king to give him time that he might tell the king the interpretation. All Daniel asked for was time. I want you to notice here how confident Daniel was in his relationship with God that he could survive the death decree, the death penalty, if God willed it. He was going to ask God for the answer, and he was guaranteeing the king that he would come back with the interpretation. That's absolutely amazing. Although Daniel did not practice witchcraft, he was being trained in the secrets of ancient Babylon at the time as a Jewish or Hebrew captive, and he was therefore being counted as a wise man. Daniel, too, would be put to death with his three friends and all those who were unable to tell the king his dream. It's no wonder that Daniel was anxious to help the king out with his dilemma. Question five says, what was the most important thing Daniel could do for God to reveal the dream to him. We go to Daniel 2, 17 and 18. Then Daniel went to his house and made the decision known to Hananiah, Mishael and Azariah, his companions, that they might seek mercies, they might seek grace and help from the God of heaven concerning this secret of prophecy. Daniel and his three friends prayed to the God of heaven, asking God to reveal the secret of the dream. Daniel knew the power of prayer. Even today, the most important and effective way to gain supernatural help is to take time to pray. When you need to unlock the mysteries in your life, when you want answers to your questions, or when you desire support and strength to cope with tough personal situations, I recommend you take time and try talking to God in prayer because it works. And I know I'm telling you. Question number six, how did God reveal the secret to Daniel? In Daniel 2.19, Daniel writes, then the secret was revealed to Daniel in a night vision. A night vision just means a dream. You know, friends, God often reveals his secret through dreams. See Numbers 12, 6. Evidently, God gave Nebuchadnezzar the initial dream and then revealed the interpretation to Daniel in a subsequent dream. Let me testify today of my experience. Very simply, praying to God brings very, very powerful answers. Do not be afraid to ask God. And continue to petition him because he loves to hear his children bring their requests before him. Question seven, what did Daniel say about the God of heaven? He was trying to describe to the king who this God actually was. 
So here are some characteristics of the God of heaven. This God of heaven that Daniel knows and King Nebuchadnezzar doesn't know changes the times and the season. It means he regulates the times and the seasons on planet Earth. Secondly, the God of heaven, the great God of heaven, almighty God, removes kings and sets up kings. Friends, this involves the leaders in our world today. This God is so powerful that he gives wisdom to the wise and he gives knowledge to those who have understanding. This is speaking about spiritual understanding. Part D. This God in heaven reveals the deep and secret things. He can reveal to us secrets in prophecy and secrets of prophecy that were given thousands of years ago. This God also knows what is in the darkness and light dwells with him. Friends, it's very clear, isn't it, that Daniel knew about the power and authority of the God of heaven. Obviously, Nebuchadnezzar didn't. He didn't acknowledge this God. So what was the overall purpose of the dream? The overall purpose of this whole dream was to reveal the hidden secret that it is God, not human kings or armies, who control the destiny of this planet. Question eight. What did Daniel say the king saw in the dream? We're going to Daniel chapter 2, and we go down to verse 31. Daniel now gives the interpretation. You, O king, were watching, and behold a great image. It's a great image. It's a great statue. It's actually called the metal man, because the king had dreamt of a giant statue. This statue stood in front of Nebuchadnezzar and was described by Daniel as awesome. Can you just imagine the king getting excited and shouting out, that's it, Daniel, you've got it. Tell me more. Question nine. What were the various elements that made up the image? We go to Daniel 2, 32 and 33. This image's head was, Daniel says, of fine gold. Its chest and arms were of silver. Its belly and thighs were of bronze. The legs were made of iron. Its feet were made partly of iron and partly of clay. Let's take a moment to jot those details down in our study guide. We're at the base of page seven. So what are the various elements made up of? There's a head of gold, part A. There's the chest and arms of silver, part B. There's the belly and thighs of bronze, part C. Friends, you might be wondering why we're going into so much detail and why are we filling in these missing elements? Because these are all symbols and illustrative of the kingdoms of the world that would come after Daniel's time. Part D, there were legs of iron. Then the feet, notice, were of jewel elements, partly made of iron and partly made of clay. They would represent something that would be partly strong and something that would be partly brittle and weak. It's interesting to note, isn't it, that God used earthly minerals as the basis for his prophecy. The value of each material deteriorates as we move down the statue. Notice it starts off with gold at the top, and ends up in a mixture of metal and mud at the bottom. Question 10, what did the stone do to the image? And what did the stone turn into? We're in Daniel chapter 2, 34 and 35. And in this seminar study series, we're using a Bible that's very, very well recognized. It's the New King James Version Bible because it's easy to understand. Daniel says to King Nebuchadnezzar, you watched while a stone was cut out without hands. That means it's not done by any human power. This stone struck the image on its feet. I want you to notice where. The feet of iron and clay and broke them to pieces. That's verse 34. Let's go on and hear the end of this in verse 35. 
And the stone that struck the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. Friends, do you remember the ancients would go up mountains and build idol groves to get closer to their gods? This may mean that this is something to do with getting closer to the true God of heaven. Daniel told the king that a supernatural rock would hit the image, not on the golden head, but at its clay-bound feet. This rock would then take the place of the image and fill the whole earth with its presence and power. Question number 11. So what do the kingdoms and what do the elements represent? They represent kingdoms. What does the head of gold represent? Daniel said to the king, you, O Nebuchadnezzar, are this head of gold. So we have to ask ourselves, was Babylon a golden kingdom? Please direct your attention to the screen. Let's review it. Nebuchadnezzar represented Babylon. Verse 39 indicates that this prophecy is primarily about kingdoms rather than kings. Isaiah had previously described Babylon as the golden city. The precious mineral gold is a perfect symbol for the wealth, power, and superiority of Babylon. You know, Babylon appeared to be impregnable to advancing armies. The city walls were 60 metres high, and they were thick enough and wide enough to hold chariot races across the top of the walls. The city had a moat around the walls with an equal cubic capacity to the walls themselves. The gates were solid brass and within the city there seemed to be limitless resources. Friends, this artist's depiction shows the beautiful blue lapis lazuli Ishtar Gate, which is now in the Pergamon Museum. About 20 years ago, I had the privilege of going to the Pergamon and I went in there searching for this gate. I walked through a large arch and as I walked through, felt very embarrassed because everyone was looking at me. As I turned around, I realised I'd just walked through the Ishtar Gate that had been reconstructed there by German archaeologists over 100 years ago. Brick by brick, the beautiful blue is absolutely radiant. And it was amazing to realise that this was probably the gate that Daniel and King Nebuchadnezzar went through. Friends, do you realise that it was the Babylonians who first charted out the heavens? They also mapped out the sun and created an ancient sundial. Did you know it was the Babylonians who discovered the system of length, area, capacity and weight? And numbers, did you know they divided the days into hours and minutes? The Babylonians were also very gifted in music and the arts, and they were also brilliant at business. It wasn't long before the city of Nebuchadnezzar became the commercial centre for the region, and riches flooded into the city. Babylon was a golden city, and it appeared to have a golden future. Friends, this was the easy part for Daniel to tell the king. What would be hard is to tell him that there would be other kingdoms that would follow him and the time for Babylon to reign was coming fast to an end. Question 12, what did the prophet Isaiah predict would happen to Babylon? Before we go into Isaiah 13, 19 and 20, I want you to see the photograph on the screen. They are actually the ruins that you can see there today in ancient Babylon. Behind it are some new buildings. These are the buildings constructed by Saddam Hussein. He wanted turn to turn ancient Babylon into like a Disneyland theme park. And so he became the horror of archaeologists for the desecration and destruction that he brought there to the ancient artifacts. So friends, we are taking you back to ancient Babylon. Question 12, what did the prophet Isaiah predict would happen to Babylon? We're going to what Isaiah wrote in Isaiah 13, 19 and 20. He prophesies the future for Babylon and it's not good. 
and Babylon, he says, the glory of kingdoms, the beauty of the Chaldeans' pride will be as when God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah. So, friends, you know what happened to Sodom and Gomorrah? They were destroyed by fire, and then they remained desolate in the desert. Let's go to verse 20. Isaiah goes on, it will never, it will never be inhabited, nor will it be settled from generation to generation, nor will the Arabian pitch tents there, nor will the shepherds make their sheepfolds there. Friends, what an amazing prediction. God predicted this city of God would become desolate. This is true to this day. Did you know Saddam Hussein of Iraq, the former ruler, now deceased, saw King Nebuchadnezzar as his idol and attempted to rebuild ancient Babylon. However, the ancient city is now gone, just as the Bible predicted. And there behind it stands the horror of archaeologists, the work that Saddam Hussein put in to try to rebuild the city. But it failed. It was never finished, just as the Bible predicted. Did you know that Nebuchadnezzar's kingdom ruled the world from 605 BC to 538 BC? But after it would come, the combined force of the Medes and Persians that overthrew Babylon. In the most amazing circumstances, over 150 years prior to the fall of Babylon, the prophet Isaiah had predicted that it would be a man by the name of Cyrus who would overthrow the city in Isaiah 45, 1 and 2. Remarkably, that is exactly what happened. The Medes and Persians were symbolized by silver. Notice the two arms. One arm stood for the Medes from Media, the other arm, the Persians from Persia. And so they were possibly not as powerful as Babylon. And so they needed to overcome the city through brains rather than sheer strength. Notice what the screen says. Cyrus, the Persian military leader, diverted the water from the river Euphrates, which was running directly through the city of Babylon. He then marched his army through the riverbed and under the city walls, claiming victory over a complacent and unsuspecting Babylon. Question 13. What metal was used to represent the third kingdom, the nation that would take over from Medo-Persia? Who would be the third medal? In Daniel 2, verse 39, Daniel speaks to the king about a third kingdom of bronze. A third kingdom of bronze. Who does this represent? Friends, all the medals represent the nations to the exact detail. Alexander the Great led the Greeks to victory over the Medes and Persians in the Battle of Arbella in 331 BC. And they used bronze helmets and shields. The Greeks were known for their bronze armor and their swift victories. The Jewish historian Josephus documented how Alexander the Great knew his destiny as a result of being shown the prophecies of Daniel. The story goes that Alexander came down destroying the countries in the north and when he got to Israel, he came to the great city of Jerusalem. He came to destroy it, but the Jewish leaders and the priests came out and showed him the ancient prophecies right here from Daniel chapter 2, that he was the third kingdom of bronze. And they said, what took you so long? We've been waiting for you. Alexander was amazed and they took him inside and wined and dined him. He then went on and did not destroy the great nation of Israel and he went down and destroyed Egypt. Question 14, what metal was used to represent the fourth kingdom? And the fourth kingdom shall be as strong as iron. This means something very significant, a very strong and harsh and ruthless kingdom. This represents the iron monarchy of Rome that broke the Greeks in 168 BC. In fact, it was the ancient Romans who were ruling at the time of Jesus. And this great superpower was dominant for over 600 years. Those long legs of time resulted in much persecution of God's people. I want to ask you, 
right now, if you know what the two legs stand for, the two arms stood for two nations joined together, the Medes and Persians. The two legs represent the Western and the Eastern Roman empires. You know, God's statue is very, very detailed and everything is symbolic. Question 15, how is the breakup of Rome into modern Europe described in this prophecy? We go to Daniel 2, 41 and 42. Daniel says to the king, whereas you saw the feet and toes, partly of potter's clay and partly of iron, the kingdom shall be divided. There's our answer. Very significant. The kingdom shall be divided. Rome would be divided up. Remember the barbarian tribes that came down and assaulted Italy from the north? So the kingdom shall be partly strong and it shall be partly fragile or partly broken. What does this actually mean? Instead of another world empire, Rome would be divided into numerous kingdoms symbolized by the ten toes. So friends, what is the big picture here? What is this all about? What's this got to do with us today? Very simply, God shares with Daniel, as you can see on the screen, a totally correct prophecy that predicts the exact history of the world for 2,500 years. That's absolutely incredible. So how did the Roman Empire break up? By 476 AD, barbarian tribes had conquered Rome, and 10 of these tribes eventually became modern Europe. For example, the Anglo-Saxons became England, the Lombards became the Italians and the Franks became the nation of France. It's amazing just how accurately this prophecy had been fulfilled. So let me read out the breakup. The Alamanni became the Germans, the Burgundians became the Swiss, the Franks became the French, the Lombards became the Italians, the Anglo-Saxons became the English, the Suevi became the Portuguese, the Visigoths became the Spanish, and there were three nations that were made extinct by a religious power that operated during the Dark Ages. They were the Heroli, the Vandals, and the Ost Ostrogoths. We'll explain that in a future session, what happened to them. Question 16 says, would the European kingdoms ever seek to unite, and how successful will they be? Daniel 2.43. Daniel said to King Nebuchadnezzar, as you saw iron mixed with ceramic or miry clay, they will mingle with the seed of men, but they will not adhere to one another, just as iron does not mix with clay. Daniel's prophesying that these nations will not stick together. What does this mean? So the nations of Europe would mix together, both economically and through intermarriage. However, the Bible predicted they would never become fully united. There, they would always be separate nations and they would never become a single entity in the same way that the United Nations, the, sorry, the United States, for instance, became a single nation. The prophecy can't be broken here. They will not adhere. They will not cleave. They will not stick. They will not work together. This aspect of the prophecy has actually thwarted dictators and military aspirants for hundreds of years, like Charlemagne, Charles V, Louis XIV, Napoleon, Kaiser Wilhelm, and Adolf Hitler. This prophecy has affected their dreams. Let's go to Kaiser Wilhelm II for his statement about Daniel's prophecy. Daniel's prophecy does not fit in with my plans. I cannot accept that. Where Charlemagne and others have failed, I will succeed. It doesn't take a great a deal of imagination to know that Adolf Hitler had the same view, that he was going to unite Europe. With an army of five million, Hitler promised to do what Kaiser Wilhelm II couldn't. He promised to unite Europe and build an empire that would last 1,000 years, and as you know, that was the Third Reich. Even the European Union, the EU, is doing its best to unite Europe today. However, according to Bible prophecy, deep divisions will remain forever. 
Some have likened modern Europe to a giant sporting team, individuals coming together in a common cause, but always retaining their individuality. Question 17, who will set up the final kingdom? Good question. We go to Daniel chapter 2 and verse 44. Daniel says to the king, in the days of these kings, O King Nebuchadnezzar, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. That's Daniel 2.44. We're thinking now about the kingdom of the stone, the stone or the rock. What does that actually mean? Does the scripture tell us? The scripture is symbolic and metaphorical and representative, but it always gives us the answer. In 1 Corinthians 10 and verse 4, the Apostle Paul says that that rock was Christ. It represents Jesus Christ. Let's understand a little bit more. The Bible predicts it will be Jesus who will set up his kingdom. It will not be China, the United States or Israel. There will be a fifth world empire, but it will be an empire ruled by the king of kings. The best news for us in session number one as we're going through this material is that this kingdom of peace will absolutely last forever. I hope you're planning and dreaming and studying to be there because it will be worth every sacrifice that you make. I can promise you that. Question 18, what will happen to the earthly kingdoms when God sets up his kingdom? We go to Daniel chapter 2 and verse 44. Daniel told the king, it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms. We're talking about the impact of the kingdom of the stone, the kingdom of the rock. So, friends, the stone strikes the statue at its feet. This indicates that Jesus will come during the time of the divided nations. The kingdoms of this world will be destroyed. This event could happen at any time. As we look down through human history, we can see that we're living at the time of the toes. Some have said we're living at the time of the toenails. Probably very accurate. Just as all the previous aspects of the prophecy have been perfectly fulfilled, so it will be that Jesus will come soon and establish his kingdom. That's what we're hoping and dreaming and praying for, the better life to come. Question 19, what did Nebuchadnezzar say about Daniel's God when he realized that Daniel could actually reveal the meaning of his dream? In Daniel 2.47, he said, truly, your God, Daniel, is the God of gods. Your God, Daniel, is the Lord of kings. And your God, Daniel, is a revealer of secrets. Friends, that's why we're doing this Bible study series called Secrets of Prophecy, for the Lord God shares with his servants, his prophets, the secrets of prophecy, and you are understanding those right now. So when Nebuchadnezzar saw that Daniel's God could remember the forgotten, foretell the future, and overrule all earthly kingdoms, he knew that this must be the true God. This was a God who both created secrets and revealed them. This God was a God to be loved. This God was a God to be worshipped, a God to be trusted and obeyed, a God who provides hope and certainty in a divided and morally weak world. There's three points we want you to remember from this Bible study. Number one, God has ultimate control over the world. It's hard to believe, but I want to tell you, by faith, we can see all these things. Number two, we're living, certainly, I believe, in the very last days of Earth's history, if you can see what's going on around planet Earth. And number three, God's new kingdom will absolutely last forever. Now, I want to come back to our title slide. Tonight, in session one of Secrets of Prophecy, we've looked at who will control the world. But did we totally answer the question? Well, I want to tell you the answer is no. There's much, much more to come. In fact, I want to tell you that in terms of who will control the world, there are many contenders. Some are saying right now the World Health Organization, through their interna international health regulations, their One Health policy, and their World Pandemic Treaty for lockdowns, 
is making a bid to be that controller. Others have said it's happening through the United Nations. Others have said it's coming through the World Economic Forum with COVID-19 and the Great Reset. Others have said it's a powerful religious group who are rounding up all the leaders of the world and bringing together a modern uh, conglomeration of the nations. So friends, did we give you all the answers tonight? No, I'm just highlighting where we're going in the future. We are going to share with you in future lessons the final superpower that will answer this question. We will share with you who is the Antichrist, part one and two. That will answer the question. We will share with you who is the beast and what is the mark of the beast. Everybody's got an idea today of what is the mark of the beast. But when we ask who is the beast, they're not sure. That's a problem. Friends, the point of tonight's study is that the powers of this world seeking to dominate us will not adhere, not cleave, not stick one to another. Yes, I know in Revelation 18, it says that these nations will be of one mind with the beast for one hour, a very brief period of time. We're going to cover that in a future study. I hope you'll join us. So friends, what did we learn today? We learned that the stone strikes the statue at its feet. God's kingdom interrupts all human history. And that second coming of Jesus Christ is what we're longing and hoping for. As we close, I have three relational questions. Do you find it easy or difficult to allow God to be in charge of your future? Just recently, I've realized that I have been very independent in my life and I've given over more of my life to God. And I've had amazing answers to prayer. I've had greater calls and I've had um, greater revelations from God than when I've been running the show myself. Let me recommend to you placing your life in God's hands. It's absolutely incredible. Number two, in what ways do you think prayer, praying to God could be helpful during a tough time? And have you ever experienced this? Let me tell you very simply, friends, prayer is always the answer. Often we don't think it's the first answer. We wait until we have to jump out of the plane and then we grab the prayer parachute. Let's pray. All else has failed. Let me testify to you that prayer is always the answer. Use it as the first answer and not the last answer. Thirdly, what have you learned from this study guide that can help you trust God more as you move into our uncertain future? If God could tell Daniel the history of the world 2,500 years in the future, surely anything you're asking is not going to be a problem at all. Think that one through. Finally, your response. After seeing the way God understands the future and has ultimate control of the events of this planet, are you willing for this God, the God of heaven, to lead you in the future of your life? You may not be ready to sign up with him now, but I want to tell you that he can take over your life and make it a whole lot better. He has a plan for your life. He loves you. He has a future plan for you in the world to come. You just have to say, yes, Lord, I want to understand you more and know you more and know what that plan is. And he will share that with you. What do we learn in tonight's lesson? Usually I go through these discovery points uh, at the beginning of the lesson tonight. I did not. Tonight's lesson, we asked what happened to King Nebuchadnezzar one night. You know the answer. He had a what? He had an amazing dream of the future. Number two, why was Daniel confident he could discover the dream? Why was he so confident? He was up against the death decree. Daniel had a resource that many Christians have forgotten, and that is he had the power of prayer. So exactly how did God rescue Daniel from certain death? Daniel knew God so well that Daniel wasn't afraid to ask God for help, and you can do the same. Number four, what did the 10 toes on the image actually represent? Anciently, they represented the 10 nations of Europe that we went through with you, the breakup of the Roman Empire into the Eastern and Western uh, 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 kingdoms. But today, they actually are represented by the EU, the European Union. Number five, who can stop God's kingdom of the stone? This is the good news. There are no powers on earth, under the earth or above the earth, that can stop the second coming of Jesus Christ. Well, I'd like to share with you just five quiz questions, and these are multiple choice. 
uh, students in school would call them multiple guests. So let's get into them and see how you go. You might like to write your answers uh, at the bottom of the lesson on page 15, or might like to just write them down on a piece of paper. We're going to give you the answer after every question and they're multiple choice. So they're very easy. They're only based on what we studied in session one in this presentation. Number one, in what year of King Nebuchadnezzar's reign did he have an important dream that he could not remember? Was it his first year of rule? Was his second year of reign? Was his third year or his fourth year? Please write down your answer now and lock it in. I think very clearly I told you in the first text in Daniel chapter 2 verse 1, the answer is the second year of his reign. Well done. Question two, what metal in the statue represented Babylon? Was it the bronze, the gold, the iron, or the silver? Surely this is too easy. So I'm going to ask you now to lock it in. Your answer is Babylon was certainly the golden kingdom. Well done, number three. Which of these metals was mixed with clay in the statue that Nebuchadnezzar saw in his dream? Was it the bronze, the gold, the iron or the silver? Which one was mixed in? And the answer very simply is, lock it in. It was, of course, the iron mixed with miry potter's clay. Number four, the rock cut out of a mountain symbolized the soon return of Jesus Christ. What part of the statue did the rock hit? Was it the head, the chest, the legs or the feet? I think we all clearly remember from the illustration and the words of Daniel that it smashed the kingdoms of this world to smithereens when it hit that statue, the metal man, the image on its feet. Number five, how did King Nebuchadnezzar describe the God of Daniel after the prophet had revealed to him the dream? Did he call him a Lord of Kings? Did he call him a God of gods? Did he call him a revealer of mysteries? And the answer is, is it one, two or three? Or is it all three? And the answer is, lock it in. <laughs> he said all three. That tells us that the God of heaven that we're studying about in the secrets of prophecy is a Lord of kings. He's a God of gods. And he is a revealer of mysteries. Friends, I want to invite you to our next session, session number two. We're going to go into signs of the times. You can download this study guide under the description bar for the next lesson and have a look at it. What are we going to learn in Secrets of Prophecy, session number two, Signs of the Times? Name one skill Jesus Christ said was essential for living at the end of time. What is that? Number two, does anyone really know the date of the return of Jesus Christ? Date settings are very, very popular these days. A lot of uh, secular and religious people are setting dates. Number three, list the five signs of the times, S-O-T-T, -T, signs of the times. The lesson will very exhaustively go through political signs, the physical or signs in nature, business signs, the economy, also social and religious signs. So this will be, as we go through these and you study your lesson guide, which I recommend you do before the next session if possible, you will say, wait a minute, that just happened a week ago or three months ago or last year. We are living in, I believe, the very end of time. Number four, in session two, we're going to learn about the greatest danger we actually face in these end times, as Jesus said. And number five, what did Jesus say we can do to be actually ready for the second coming of Christ? That's session two, signs of the times. I hope you can join us. Friends, I want to close with this thought. What's your view of the future? Many have a very dark and dismal, discouraging and depressing view of the future of just annihilation here on planet earth or prison planet but i want to tell you that there is hope the ancient biblical writings the god of daniel the god of abraham isaac and jacob has given us a plan and this plan is going to be outlined to you in this amazing series secrets of prophecy fresh questions deep subjects clear answers a 24 study uh bible study series extravaganza and we're inviting you to join us and that will allow you to see through your tears the reality of a hope with God that comes from outside of this world because we certainly can't save ourselves let us pray
Gracious Heavenly Father, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Holy Spirit, I thank you for this amazing Bible study. Bless everyone who hears these words with wisdom and understanding. Bless us as we continue to study the signs of the times that we might rightly know, like the men of Issachar, and be men of understanding, that we might know the times. Until we meet again, may we be safe and in your love, we ask in Jesus Christ's powerful name. Amen. I want to thank you so much for joining us for Secrets of Prophecy Session 1. And I hope that next time you can uh, you can join us and uh, that this will be a great blessing to you. I'm going to say thank you and goodbye till next time. Bye-bye. <laughs>